Good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, I'm pleased uh, that, I, that I'm your host in this uh, first talk of our online series uh, to biodiversity business topic. And uh, our guest today is uh, Robin Winogrand. She's uh, based in Zurich. Myself, I'm an architect. I'm writing about architecture and building culture, and I'm uh, part of this team since 2016. We are working on biodiversity in urban areas, and this special project, Boogie Bob, started in 2019, and uh, this is our final part of our mission in this project, in this international project. The realization of this online conference instead of a symposia in reality. So um, I would like to uh, present to you a little bit uh, Robin Winogrand. As I said, she's American, she's a landscape architect and an urban designer, and she's uh, co-founder of uh, Studio Vulcan Landscape Architecture. Uh, with uh, headquarter in Zurich and in uh, Munich. And she was part of there from 2014 to 2020. Currently, she's working independently as well in collaboration with Studio Vulcan. And she's teaching at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And as well, she's a lot in juries, uh, is doing lecturing, teaching and publishing. Her work seeks to design and build powerful site-specific uh, experiences of, of often theoretical and ephemeral matters such as atmosphere, imagination, spaces of a social engagement, identity of place, and embodied experience. Uh, maybe it's better to ask herself uh, what she's working at at the moment uh, because Studio Vulcan and, and she uh, has been very successful in the last years. Uh, I counted 11 prize, first prizes uh, in 2020 and up to now in 2021. So I'm sure that uh, quite a lot of, uh, of those projects were still when she was there. And um, so they are very successful. And um, this project, this special project she brought in um, she started with her own company before they merged uh, with another office. So, so to become uh, Studio Vulcan, that was, uh, yeah. So Robin, tell us a little bit of what your actual topics are and what projects you're, you're working on. Yes, thank you, Marina. And uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to have been invited. And it's nice to see you again after all these years. And um, and be involved in this uh, very interesting theme, which is not the main focus of my work, but it's something I'm in fact quite interested in as well. Um, and in fact, I <clears throat> will begin the lecture this evening with a little bit of a main focus that I have in many of my projects. So I will do that in a moment. And yeah, I think we can just start the lecture in that case. It's a certain approach that I've developed over the years with many projects. And it's kind of come to a head and it's what I've been teaching in Harvard. And I think it describes this project very well. Although when I did this project, which began in 2009, in fact, um, and then was stopped many times. So it was finally built in 2016, basically. Um, and at that time I hadn't formulated these thoughts as, as clearly about atmosphere identity and so on as you've just read. So I will just begin the lecture with those ideas and um, the rest we can do after. Yeah, but, but before you start with the lecture, I, I do a little bit of an intro uh, in total why we are uh, gathering here and what is about uh, this biodiversity business talks. We know that industrial and commercial premises hold an enormous potential in terms of climate change mitigation and the promotion of environmental qualities. And uh, the role of biodiversity as an integral part of innovative and forward-looking urban developments is the subject of this online series. We chose the, we picked three model cases 
uh, projects um, and to show how planners, business and local authorities were successful uh, in their action they took. Uh, and um, we picked uh, three, also they're not really um, classical uh, business premises because uh, we picked a, a museum, then a high tech campus, uh, and a school building, but uh, as well, public buildings like the museum and the school are in fact um, companies run by, by, by the state and are as well a sort of, sort of business and, and they have, a, uh, let's say, they, they're very valuable in their environment and can provide a lot of benefits for, for, the, um, for the quarter they're built in. So at this Museum of Natural History, in fact, uh, in St. Gallen and uh, the uh, high-tech campus in Klaus and uh, the school in Paris, give a, an overview over this different approaches which can be chosen. And in 2019, in March, a new independent global review was announced on the economics of biodiversity led by Professor Sir Parta Dasgupta. Uh, parallel to our EU project uh, uh, on a more global level and more international level. Um, uh, das Gupta is a very renowned uh, scientist and economist, uh, which did a lot of research in environment, in underfeeding, in poverty, in sustainability. And the UK did a commission on, on uh, him with uh, this review. Uh, so they should assess the economic benefits of biodiversity globally, assess the economic costs and risk of biodiversity loss and identify a range of actions that can simultaneously enhance biodiversity and deliver economic prosperity. And uh, we, in our project, we as well are doing assessment uh, of companies and it's uh, already uh, let's say it's it's already very common that um, companies uh, know a, a lot about sustainability and how to build an, an office building or a production site, but uh, they don't have this value of biodiversity in their environment, what it can contribute to their company, not uh, uh, as present as, as let's say, the, the building itself. So um, it's really time to act uh, for our well-being uh, because uh, our uh, environments are extremely complex at the moment already. And the motto is digitization and the mean to this end. Uh, so if, if you're building bi biodiverse in your environment, uh, uh, then of course you offer a, an ambience which reduces stress, provides space for exercise and encounter and regenerates our vital spirits. And as well, biodiversity can do a lot for our climate protection, as we know. And uh, so, as I said, many companies are familiar with ecological standards, uh, but it needs a holistic approach uh, to protect the climate and to, to make some measurements uh, to provide a natural water balance, retention, and uh, to use uh, as much as foliage as possible on the building and around the building. And in the end, it's uh, why it's time to act. It's for biodiversity itself, uh, because our cities and urban areas offer a lot of habitats for many species of flora and fauna, and even sometimes more than the, the surrounding countryside. So this is what happens as well in, in the work of uh, Robin uh, Winograd will show us today. When I was there in uh, St. Gallen, I was really, uh, let's say, charmed by this surrounding. And uh, it was like entering a little bit in a fairy tale. And immediately you get captured by and moved by this mixture of culture and uh, wild nature and I think it may, might be the most sophisticated of those three projects we got to offer in these talks uh, uh, because we got a really 
very interesting concept behind uh, its design. And it's, Robin, as she told, uh, it's not her focus, biodiversity, but she achieved exactly that, uh, that in the, in the end, with all her measurements, there is a lot of, of biodiversity. It became really a habitat, uh, not only for uh, stressed uh, workers around this, uh, in that area or the staff of the museum, it became as well a, a habitat for a lot of uh, amphibians and animals and birds and uh, shows a, a very uh, refined uh, combination of nature and artistical concept. Uh, so I'm very excited that you will present us this project and uh, afterwards we got the possibility we offer the possibility to our uh, guests that uh, they can uh, provide their questions and uh, yeah, let's start. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Marina. Okay, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, as I said, and um, I think I, I chose this project together with Marina because it's a project that had many, many challenges. It took, as you heard, from 2009 to 2016, 17. In fact, we finished completely to build because there were many hindrances and among them challenges that made up challenges for the biodiversity. So it's a good object to learn a lot from, I would say, and a very, um, almost you have to smile, but the conditions were, were somehow surrealistic to a certain degree. So um, now I just need to find out how to move ahead on this with this, how this all worked before, no? How do we go to the next page? This never happened before. Huh? No, it's not working. It's not going forward. Right clicking on the right side. Click on the right side. Or use your... Yes, got it. Thank you. Okay, so this is a photo collage by a zero graphic designer. And I think it shows very well this issue of biodiversity. And it also shows the issue that I work with, which I've coined for myself in search of geographical re-enchantment. And it's basically about the fact that we've gone from very, on the left side of the image, very um, natural biodiverse circumstances in this more bucolic era with small user groups, small land parcels, um, and less people, less people having a lobby to talk about the landscape and moving very much towards the right side of the picture, which are large landowners, um, uh, incredibly dense conditions set upon the landscape, uh, which need to be fulfilled. Everything from high productivity of fruit trees to recreation, to ecology, to traffic planners, to rec I mean, all the things, all the people want something from the landscape. And this is the big challenge we have today is how do you uh, merge these two? So it's interesting uh, a bit to look at Switzerland, which is in fact a very tiny country. And this is a German photographer, Thomas Struth, who did this photo series just uh, near Winterthur, just outside of Zurich. And of course, it's a very wry way of what we call landscape. Let's go for a walk in the landscape and how soulless it's become and how uh, the lack of biodiversity, the lack of visual diversity, the lack of experiential diversity. And this is a typical image of Switzerland where what we call the agglomeration here or the urban periphery, the urban edge um, spreads all over the place because the country doesn't have that much buildable land. So we have a lot of these conditions that in fact do become faceless and sterile, uh, both in terms of biodiversity and in terms of experience. And the question is, where can we get to today? This is a picture of the Glatz, Glatz. it's a stream on the edge of Zurich, and you can see where nature's trying to come up wherever it can under this myriad of train tracks, highway, bicycle paths, bridges, everything's happening here. It's all in a concrete, the water is in a concrete basin. And what is the role that we find today for nature? And an image from the airport park, which I'm just finishing constructing with Studio Volcan, where you have artificially planted wetlands and woodlands next to parking house, parking garages and, and advertising. And this is, that's the part of the humor in a way, this geographical re-enchantment to say, how do we take our sites on the urban edge today and make them again in a kind of a magical state where we can really enjoy them. And in fact, the Museum of Natural History is on an urban edge. So this is a discussion about the um, atmosphere books and the, the plea in some of these books about atmosphere and architecture 
that uh, put more atmosphere on our projects, but our project sites generally look more like this and not like Paris in the 1920s. And so how do we become, how do we make poetic and strong places? And I took this expression from this wonderful um, social geographer, Alistair Bonnet from England. He speaks about geographical reenchantment. And in fact, the need to make places today that can really move us and, and get under our skin in addition to all the ecological and functional needs that we ha have to do. So that's pretty much the focus of my work. Um, I'm quite interested in the ecological issues, but I, to date, haven't been, haven't been really so focused as I would also like to be in the future. And you'll see in this project, the attempt to bring in, as Ma uh, Marina said, the integration of all these different factors. The subtitle of this project, I call it, you see here, Natural History on a Highway Tunnel. This was the site before the park. It is um, from biodiversity. You can tell a very, very low point system, and there's almost none. It's a fertilized cow pasture, uh, sports fields on the right, uh, highway on the left. Um, so it went from being that, the site is directly in the middle where the highway disappears under a crossing road. And that's in fact, the site that we just looked at. It's sitting on top of a highway tunnel and spanned between the new museum of natural history on the, on the right, and on the left, a beautiful cathedral, the backside. Oops, sorry. So this is the site. And the big question posed is, of course, first of all, what is natural history? Because my job in the first line of action was to talk about natural history. And the brief during the competition was uh, basically there were two things. It was, in fact, an uh, architectural competition with the landscape aspect. And in the brief was simply um, the question to make a small pond where kids could take water or users could take water and look under the microscope at the microbes in it. And the second was to make a dry field, Talkenwiese. And other than that, there were no conditions and neither myself nor anyone else knew what would come out of this project. But when, of course, you have the task to do, you first you have to ask what is natural history? What is nature? What is landscape? These words are very difficult words. And if nature includes human beings, then of course we have to talk about the relationship human to nature. And how does one make a place on this urban periphery, that's a cow pasture, a place where people actually get lost in these questions and start to, start to become curious about these questions. So I found that to be the strongest task that I could fulfill would be to make a place where people would get lost in an atmosphere and be set up with a set of conditions that would in fact be catalyst for their imagination and their curiosity about the relationship between humans and nature. To do that, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do this evening is very briefly explain the design of the project and the result of the project. And then I'm gonna go through the different aspects related to the planting schemes and a lot of the hindrances we ran into and so on. So I'll just first give you an, an idea about the project itself. So the, the keywords for me were on one side, immersion, how in this little place surrounded by multifamily housing, school, highway, single family housing, everything you ever wanted, service industries. How do you get lost? How do you immerse yourself? And um, there were two ways in which I did that. What you see now, the next question is, do I have a cursor that you can see? Probably not, if I'm not mistaken. In Zoom, yes. Oh. We can see it, we can see it. I see my hand, good. What you'll see here is on the, on the top side of the park, which is north, and on the bottom side, which is south, you'll see that there's uh, woodland bosques or woodland groves to a degree, you'll, you'll hear the rest in a moment, that actually make the, separate the space from its surroundings. I'm not usually a fan of that technique, but in this case, it was important that the people could really immerse themselves in a space so that they could get lost in this storytelling. And the second thing I did was take the, gar the thousands of year old tradition gardens of stepping stones and make, uh, and use them at a jumbo scale. So I made stepping stones that are seven to over 20 meters in length, almost 25 meters in length. And the reason is that when we walk on stepping stones, we're not uh, goal oriented from A to B, I'm rushing, I'm looking at my iPhone, whatever, but we walk very gingerly. We look at where we place our feet and we become very aware of our surroundings and we move into a state in our bodies that allows us to have all of our senses open. So what you're seeing here are these groves that separate the space, including hedges, and these, pavers, which you'll then see in the photos, how people can move through this space and get lost in the storytelling about um, what I like to call 
again, it's, it's not for me, it's actually was related to the painter um, Robert Sund, uh, someone used to deny 18, I forget what, 65 or something in the newspaper, uh, Natürliche Kunstlichkeit, Kunstliche Natürlichkeit, which in English is natural artificiality and artificial naturalness. It rhymes in German. And I found that to be a very appropriate issue for this place about natural history on a highway tunnel and about the paradoxes and the contradictions of how we build today and how we can build natural space in completely artificial conditions. So I, my attempt was not to make an imitation natural place. That was also not the brief to make a natur na garden. The brief was basically, or, or the, the need was to make a place that confronts people with the issues in a realistic way. How do we look realistically at the issue of how we build today artificially? So here you see the design fairly close after planting, which means the vegetation hasn't filled in. Uh, 40 degrees in summer for two weeks, it's very dry and also very still in the very basic states. But you see the beginning of this grows on the side and this path, which is also for handicapped, moving through with these jumbo stepping stones and jumbo quotes. And so forth. Here's a kind of close up of that. Um, you'll see in a moment what the concrete did. So the concept was that these concrete stepping stones, I'm oh, sorry, I'm gonna take one more step. And there's one important thing also, and you'll, I'll jump back and forth a bit between the biodiversity and the design. But what you're looking at here is the first thing I did. And that was, we didn't have a lot of money. So while I was looking at what, to make, what material to make the stepping stones from, I went to this beautiful stone quarry called Berlocher. And all of this giant um, gravel you're seeing, they gave to us for a very, very cheap price. So I said, oh, look, I'm gonna cover the whole park with this gravel. The reason being you can walk in the whole park. You don't follow a path that pre-interprets like, hey, hey, everybody walk here and here and here, but it allows you to get lost in this space. And then what they had are, they had these broken architectural relics from the same famous stone, which is used for all the cultural institutions, museums and churches and chapels. And so I put those in the park. So the first thing you have is a huge ground plane of this gravel, which is permeable. And then mixed in with the storytelling, what did the human beings make out of this natural material? You see it in a natural form and you see it in the cultural form as well. And then the um, pavers became concrete because I found that very interesting as well. The main stone of Eastern Switzerland is called Nagelfleur. It's a conglomerate stone brought by the glacier period. And it's actually the natural form of concrete. So by taking concrete, I was able to play with the dialogue again between the natural and man-made. And we took this concrete and mishandled it, or one, however one could say, in an entire series of ways to make the discussion of natural and man-made. And so you see here when, when we hit it with a, whatever it's called, chisel, it looks identical to non -flow. It looks identical to the natural form. And that's why the vertical sides are done with wooden lats from concrete forms, or I press drain mats into it. So you could really see that the concrete is the natural form of the stone and also can be created from humans into the form that they like. Then um, I found it very interesting to go back in history and, and to again be a catalyst of imagination. So I worked quite closely with specialists from the museum one of them being the specialist for the fossils. And um, from all the possible fossils that are in the museum, I chose particular ones that we could recast into this concrete. So the concrete actually became a carrier of messaging about the relationship between our either natural history or relationship of humans to natural history, et cetera. And these are the forms we used. And here's a dinosaur head that's about 60, 70 meters long. It's like a centimeters, probably. You know, different pieces of animals. So what happens is rather than making a layer fad, like a kind of a path where you get signs, and that's what they do in the museum. Here you see the following. The idea was that the garden has fragments. You keep tripping across something and you think, hmm, what's that? And it instigates your imagination to ask questions, to be curious. And then in the museum, you can find the answers if you like. And here you see the vegetation just beginning to fill in. This is last year after three seasons. This year I'll go back and it will become even richer and even more full. 
And these on these pavers are giant letters about 30 centimeters high with um, uh, scientific expressions, quotes from Darwin, from Max Planck, from the Bible. So you again trip across information which asks questions, Arctic, Alpine, etc. Supercontinent. And uh, another thing I did was I always, I grew up in Chicago where there's a fabulous museum of natural history, but I could never remember the dates because they have these um, insane numbers like 300 billion trillion years or something. So you always think, what, what was that again? So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna reduce it to three main geological eras so that everyone from the kid to the grandparents can remember these three eras. And these are the three most important eras of Switzerland. Um, the Molasse, the Kreidemir, the Molasses, and the ice site, which means the melting of the, of the glacier. And the park then refers to, in its different attitudes, refers to these three um, eras. And what you have is, in fact, that uh, it used to be a, a, a tropical um, ocean there. So you have palm leaves and, and sharks and all these kinds of things. And there's all kinds of references to these three eras. And among them, to the glacial melt, is just another little funny story I'm going to tell, and then I'll move on to the more factual things. Um, when I began the project, I said to the geologist, who I also work closely with, oh, I'd like to grind up all these colored stones you have in the region and put those colors into the concrete. And he said, um, no, I'm sorry, we only have beige and brown stones here. And I said, oh, that's uh, quite odd, because in fact, when I go to the river to collect the stones to study them, there's blue and green and red and yellow and all these colors. And he said, ah, yeah, those are the erratics or Findlingen, as they say in German, they roll down from the neighboring cantons. So I, find it, I found that a quite a nice imagery. And I, in fact, went then to a river and pulled out these eight and 10 ton giant, uh, they're meter 50, whatever, giant um, erratics and put them in the park so that they're rolling into the park. So it again refers to this third era of the park. So without going into detail, there's a lot of clues to the history of the place and the natural history of the place embedded within the park. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to um, a bit about the relationship, let's say of the dynamics of the park, the dynamics of the planting and what that can be in terms of a richness of habitat in different ways. The park is a very moody park. It changes um, its atmosphere in many places and it changes its atmosphere with the weather quite a lot. It has these very, in German, they have a nice word, lauschig, this sort of lovely places where these beautiful flowering plants are butted up against the facade and in shade and so on. Then it has these um, open fields uh, with the flowering fields. And then it, it comes to a different, so, so what I want to say, actually, it's very dynamic. It can look like this on one day and you come back a month or two later and all of a sudden it looks like this and it keeps changing. It's changing every month when you go back um, the look of the place. So it's a very dynamic place in and of itself and it's intended to be that way. Um, and going back to what I said before that the whole park is first of all laid with this gravel so that in fact, it's permeable, but you can walk anywhere you'd like. And this also creates certain niches for, um, for certain kinds of flora and fauna. But this is before any planting came out. This is before the field came up and so on. And then there's an entire set of circumstances in which, uh, I just want to go back once, the attempt to make a huge variety of habitats and climate and atmosphere and places for people. It's a very small park, in fact. But what happens is, um, first of all, you have this, well, first of all, the path system has a hierarchy. So here you have these big pavers um, and the main paths. You have kind of secondary paths that look like this. And then you have tertiary paths, which you can see here on this plan, these little tiny paths that cross the fields and so on and allow you to move between. They're just about 60, 70 centimeters wide. So alone through the hierarchy of movement of the visitor, you create a different, a possibility for the biodiversity. And then there's the idea of zoning. And you see here an early scheme that we did in terms of the zoning that changed a little bit afterwards, but you see here the number three, that's the woodland. The number one is this uh, dry field. The number two is not explicitly a dry field because it's on a slope. So the moisture runs down towards the museum, which is on your right. 
The number four is where the pond is. So we put in a lot of plants that are related to water or even can grow into the water and so on. And number five is where the church, which is on the left, would like to hold masses or messe. So we put in shotaraz and this, this um, gravel under the grass so that they could actually put a lot of chairs and so on. So you have these different habitats, uh, these different kinds of habitats. And what that creates is quite a lot of edge conditions. And as we all know, it's the edge conditions that actually become quite interesting for many flora and fauna. You have a way of sort of peeking out of the woods or peeking from the, from the fields into the woods and so on. Then uh, these are some pictures of the sunny fields. So it's a very sunny, dry atmosphere and, and they actually look amazing in, in summer. And what you see here, of course, are a lot of the dandelions. They are the white, I forget the word in German, I'm sorry, I have Latin. But um, the problem was, I'm gonna go through a lot of the hindrances we ran into. We had quite a strict project leader from the city. She did a fantastic job. She didn't come from landscape. And she said, we have to plant the, the field now. And we said, no, if we plant this in spring, it's gonna be, there'll be too much competition from the weeds and the plants we want in the mix won't come up. And she said, no, I wanna to stick to the time plan. That's our obligation. We said, okay, but we're not gonna get the field we want if we do that. I don't care. So in fact, it did happen that the weeds took over and became much more strong. And that was really a problem as uh, one of the problems that we face in terms of biodiversity. This is a picture from in the woodland. This is, I think, the second year of growth. So it's still quite empty in there. I'll show you how it moved forward. And I think there's, <laughs> I, I was just looking at the numbers and I forget, but I think 1400 um, perennials in the garden. Um, we can look at the plant list in a moment. This incredible wide diversity and the plants chosen are 75% uh, natives. So they are not 100% natives. And I will talk about that in just a moment as well. Here you see it beginning to fill in and this will continue over the next years as the, the ferns and all these plants become bigger and bigger and um, so a place you can really get lost in. And now comes a very important issue about this park and that is it's on a tunnel as we already know. Um, but when we were just going into beginning the construction drawings, Astra, which are the highway, the federal highway authorities, they came to us and they said, look, we, Astra is a new organization, it's federal. And before that each canton or state had their own organization. And so they inherited this tunnel. And they, when we began to work on the park in 2010, they said, um, we're gonna do some borings to see if the tunnel is strong enough. It's from the 1970s. And we said, could you please do the borings now? Because then we'll know. And they said, no, no, we're gonna do them in some years. We don't have any time. So they did in fact, their borings just before we went into construction drawings and they came back and said, I'm so sorry, you can't build a park here. This tunnel is very weak, it might fall apart. And we said, well, thanks a lot, you know, for checking and we're like finished with the design basically. And so we said, well, couldn't we just put something there? And they said, okay, you can put shrubs up to three meters. I'm sorry, that's gonna be a completely new design. It's too late, the building's, you know, finished and now it's going under construction. And so we, I just want to tell a story just so you can imagine how complex this is. I am afraid, Marina, I didn't look at the time when I began to speak. Are, do you have your eye? Is it okay? I probably. Um, yes, you, you, uh, you did uh, uh, 20 minutes by okay. now. Good, thank so you. Maybe uh, you should finish it in about five, 10 minutes lately, most yeah. lately. I think so I have only 10 time for questions. That's good, yeah. Um, so, so they actually said, well, we'll get some experts, some external experts to look, and I won't name any names, but they got some external experts, and the external experts said, I'm so sorry, you can't build anything on this tunnel. So I began to do my own research. I began to call up nurseries and specialists and all these people and engineers and stuff, and I, and I came to the conclusion that it just can't quite be right. So I called up the engineering office that said, you can't build, and I said, look, look, I'm not getting the same information you have. Could you help me out a little bit? And they confessed that they were actually told they had to, they had to confirm the message and it wasn't quite the case. And no one wanted to lose face because it has gone on for years. And so I said, Good, could, I know, I understand. No one wants to lose face. We're really far in the process, but couldn't we find a way to make the park? 
So when, what happened is we went into an entire year of process. And here you can see in the section, there's very, very little earth over the tunnel. And the conclusion, I'll shorten up the whole story because it's so complex, but basically what happened is rather than the very big mix of trees that I was planning to use, I was only allowed to take trees that are very flat roots and that don't weigh a lot and that don't become very large. So I chose the hornbeam tree because it has the dense branches so it would look like a lot of vegetation, but we were only allowed to have a certain weight per square meter. So we did these in about one year of diagrams. I would have loved to show them how they're gonna grow, how the weight's gonna be distributed and changed from a more biodiverse plant reflection to the, to the uh, hornbeam as the leading tree species. And outside of the tunnel then we could take larger trees. And we, I wanted to take multi-stem and that wasn't even allowed either. So you can kind of imagine the constraints, but at least we could take the hornbeam. That was already a big um, success. So the idea was to put as many hornbeams as possible to make this filter, but as I said, that wasn't possible either. We had to spread them out quite a lot. Um, and so the question becomes, how do you make a space you can become immersed in um, when you have so little vegetation to work with? And we did diagrams up to 40, 60 years even, how this vegetation would fill in and what it would weigh. So we were able to build the project, which was already a, a huge success, but they came with certain conditions. And one of them was a trick I used, which upset uh, some people from Pro Natura, and they may be listening tonight, but I will bring that into discussion what happened. Uh, you can see here the, the species planted on the edges under the, what I call woodland bosque, uh, the shrubs, and then come the whole layer of perennials. And <clears throat> I decided to take the hydrangea which is not native to the northern side of the Alps. And this really, really upset some people because it was a non-native. But what happened was I wasn't allowed to put anything that had woody roots on top of the tunnel. So it meant that the park was gonna fall apart. And I said, okay, this, I researched this as well. And I, okay, the larger hydrangea, they have woody roots, but the smaller ones, it's debatable. Are they fleshy or are they woody? What is that? So I could take the hydrangea as a species that would connect the whole park. Otherwise, there would be these huge, I have to see if I got it, there would be these huge, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find this the image of the tunnel again. And these huge swaths where there's no vegetation at all, it kind of looked like a death zone. Like, I can't have that. So I did take this hydrangea. And the other reason I took the hydrangea was I really specifically wanted to open up the discussion about natural and artificial. And I did not want to take something and say, oh, it's all natives and so on. And the last point I'd like to make to that is um, to even up to two, three years ago, all of our clients were saying you have to take everything native, not all, but many, everything native. And so if you took hydrangea or anything south of the Alps, it was you know, really a problem. And now because of the hot summers and the dry summers, they're saying everyone, including foresters and everybody is looking to the south of the Alps to say, what can we plant? So there's been a paradigm shift just within those few years, um, which is interesting. Okay, so in terms of the lower level, this is another point. I, I'll just go over this point about creating different habitats. The sunny fields and the woodland space, the shady woodland areas, um, the gravel on the ground, the hierarchy of paths creates a diversity of, of um, habitats. The planting density, which I was just showing you, um, I'll go into the concrete in a moment. Then the vertical layering is another trick, um, the, having the, these different vertical layers, which we all know is also quite important. So the list of plants that we use and how the plants meet with the concrete. And this is just kind of showing the distribution of trees and you see the red zones where nothing was allowed to stand except hydrangea and perennial. So that was good that I managed that. And here you see kind of the more active, um, the last plan of this were the different fields. And I think what's interesting here is all, another point that Pro Helvetia was really upset about, which also was a technical constraint that they didn't know is that, <laughs> well, there's two points. One is you see the light green to the left and the darker green where this field, we put in two different seed mixes. And of course, one can argue, well, that's ridiculous because they're going to mix afterwards. But that was actually what Tony, uh, the, the head of the, the director of the museum said, that's fine. It's interesting to watch how these things mix. Um, so that was actually programmed into it. But the bigger factor is we were only allowed to dig down 20 centimeters because of the tunnel. 
And in 20 centimeters, you know that all the seeds of the old plants are still under there. So no matter what you plan, all these other things are also going to break through and disturb the biodiversity that we would have liked to have. So we were confronted with an entire set of conditions that really made problems. And here you see um, the larger hydrangea with the field before it's mowed. And then I actually wanted to get to the concrete a bit and just talk about how this concrete is bigger, smaller, more raw, less raw in very shady conditions, very hot, sunny conditions, and also in fact becomes a very good uh, habitat creator. And then we get to the maintenance, and that's quite interesting. You see how they decided to begin doing mowing patterns with the field. So you see the high field and then the mowed field. And this creates some very interesting imagery as well. It's completely changed the quality of the space. Here you see how the hydrangea are, are in the background. And if you take them out, the park does become less. It has something of a garden aspect, which I felt was also important to become also a beautiful place. Because again, the mowing, the concrete. And the last factor to the um, biodiversity that's also interesting, there's both flowing water in this um, fountain, which the church asked us explicitly to do. They considered it the source of life. So they asked for fountain. And this is the flowing water. But this is the pond that they asked for and the standing water that's there. And you can see this is also fairly, let's see, one or two seasons after planting. And this is starting to fill in now with the aquatic and semi-aquatic or, or moisture loving plants that we used for this water area. So this is starting to also get, um, come into fruition as a beautiful place. And in the background, you see again, the mowing patterns. And so I will finish up the lecture now and with two different images. This first one is a technical plan. And it just, I'd like to go back to where I began of this artificial naturalness and natural artificiality. This is a highly, highly artificial place. And everyone knows it because you know there's a highway running on you because you see it next to you. And still, it was the attempt to make a place where you could fall into it and learn a lot from all this different messaging, which is embedded in, in the site, which I didn't go into too much detail about. But there's many, many kinds of riddles and messaging in there. And this last image I take is just to kind of show this relationship between all these elements that were used on the site. On the right, you see it's still in the winter winter look. But a swamp cypress, which is, I planted, uh, Metasequoia, in the area where this used to actually grow there, where it used to be a tropical, tropical ocean. Then the tree trunks, which have this archaic look and which become very good habitats for many uh, flora and fauna, fauna mostly. And then the concrete, the artificial concrete, which is again then hit so it looks like Nagaflor, and then this very beautiful facade of the new museum in the background, which is the negative um, imprint of tree trunks. And so that being said, this is, I think, the task of how to, well, and it, oh, I'm sorry, there's one last little story I would like to tell here. And that is that the newest development is that uh, Tony, the museum's director, decided he would like to bring in milkweed because butterflies like milkweed and something that's also very interesting to me. It's a very aggressive plant. He's planted it now. It's taking over like crazy and taking over parts of the woodland look, etc., and destroying what was there. One can say that's fine. It's a play garden. It's an experimental garden. It is detracting from the spatial thing. But when I ran into him last time when I was there, I always go and check a little bit how it's developing. He looked, I said, how's the park going? He said, well, you know, we planted the milkweed, but the butterflies haven't come because they are much slower than we are. We can plant the milkweed, but we don't know when the butterflies are going to show up. So I think that says a lot. And I think that's the experiment that we're in right now is putting these uh, habitats in the urban conditions and mostly also on the um, urban periphery and the challenges that we all have in the density of users that we have to try and meet. So in the end, also to say the city really backed the project and said, look, the main task of this project is not per se biodiversity. It is per se a museum. It's a pedagogic space. It's a learning space, it's a neighborhood park, and then it should also have ecological functions. So it's actually in that prioritizing that we developed the project over those many years. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, that uh, really accomplishes uh, our expectations. And uh, as I have been there recently uh, and the vegetation was not yet 
as far. Uh, I'm really uh, keen to, to go over again in, in about a month and have another look at it. And I'm sure it, it's uh, completely different. Um, it's funny that you brought in uh, this uh, uh, Gerhard Richter landscape picture because I picked uh, by, by Katrin Hook, the curator of the Kunsthaus Zürich. Uh, uh, I watched a video about the show and then there she says that landscape is a construction of reality. Uh, pe people talk about uh, landscape, but nature exists in a, its own right, uh, whether or not it's labeled as landscape. And um, it has a lot to do with, with your project here, because uh, it's really, it, it, it is in fact an artificial landscape. And on the other hand, it got this wide aspect, which seems to be so natural and so much nature as we would like to have in, in our cities. Uh, we got some questions already uh, heading in. Uh, I can see that David, David Brassford from World Green Infrastructure Network is here again, uh, like in, in one of our last uh, meetings. And, uh, and he got an interesting question. Maybe David, you just, uh, uh, um, you can come in uh, if you want, you, uh, you get, can come in in the discussion panel and with the camera on if you, if you want to. Otherwise you can, uh, if not, but I think you, you would like to, then put on your, we put on your camera if you want to, and you can ask the question yourself. Um, that would be nice if you're seeing you. Hello. Yeah, David, hello. Uh, you can put uh, your camera on then. We can yeah, I, I'm trying to start it, but it doesn't ah. um, seem to be starting i just had a meeting right before this David is joining this us video. from Norway. yeah okay so anyway let's not use time on uh, looking at me thanks for the uh presentation that was really wonderful and uh very, very pleasing to look at uh so my my question was about the uh species diversity that we will see on the same project in 30 to 40 years uh, because to me, it seems like a, a huge, wonderful experiment where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, about what will be there uh, in, in 40 years, uh, which is wonderful uh, and hopefully has uh, positive consequences for everyone who, who will use it and nothing um, unexpected and, and unpleasant. But uh, I, I just wondered if, if you could go a little bit more into your strategy for dealing with uh, the intentional versus the unintentional aspects, uh, and especially with uh, the species progression that you know will happen uh, over time. I think it's a very good question. And it's a question that I, probably can't answer because I did not research it. I think the intention was that there are other specialists. I mean, the museum itself are the specialists in that. And what I did as a landscape architect is create conditions. So there's moist conditions, dry conditions, sunny conditions, shady conditions, conditions with many people, conditions with few people, or much more disturbance, less disturbance. Uh, it's a tiny park, if I'm really honest. It's almost more like a garden, a scale garden. And so the species progression from my side or even <clears throat> our side was not the focus of, of how we planned the plants. The, the intention was to take a great majority of natives, of blossoms, of, of, of different kinds of uh, conditions, large leaf, small leaf, and then to let it uh, develop as it develops or actually to let the museum develop. But I mean, they were involved in all the steps, of course, and they knew exactly what plants we were planting. And, and what strategy we were following. So um, that, that I really have to just be honest, it was not uh, among the many, many things we had to solve. I didn't go through the declination of saying, when we take this and these species, it's gonna be that and that. And in 30, 40 years, I think there are many, many factors that will determine that, including if the federal authorities decide to cap the trees or let the trees grow to their full size, which should not be a problem. Um, there's several oak trees and di different, there's a certain amount of mix I got in there. Um, 
so I, I think that's not the point that where my landscape architecture is coming from, not that I wouldn't like to know and wouldn't like to go there with experts who would consult me about that, but I did leave that to the experts and not, and yeah. Thank you. In, in that context, um, um, maybe that pops up the question about the gardeners and uh, the people who are maintaining the, the site. Um, could you explain a little bit uh, how it works or? Well, in fact, the, the museum is, is uh, making it up as they go along. I mean, they're, they're quite pleased with it. And I think the, the whole neighborhood, it's, it's very, very well used. But for example, they decided to do this mowing. They didn't ask me what I think of it. It does break the coherency, but I think it, it makes its own kind of great, you know, great attitude. So they're quite interested in, even within this very small space of doing the mowing and the non-mowing and, and seeing what that creates in terms of different conditions, or they just put in the milkweed in a place that's not so opportune for, <laughs> for the design, but they're, they're maintaining it as they go and using it a bit as a laboratory. And I feel, that's really fair. I think, you know, they know what the structure is and if they feel that it can change dramatically and that's going back to David's question, if it can change dramatically in the next years because they decide they wanna look at different issues, then I think that's their right. So of course we made this, um, I can't think of my English has kind of gone to pot, but the plague plan is a maintenance plan, I guess. Um, we made one and said, here's what we think has to happen. You know, of course, how often do you weed and how much do you control the development in the woods? Um, which things take over? How transparent is, that? transparent is the space? I mean, the conditions that I think are important for the park as a park for the museum. And then the rest is really going to be in their hands. And I'm also quite interested to see what will happen. But what I think is very critical, just to go, just to round that out, I think, for example, we all know the edge conditions are so important, and the, the park creates quite an extended edge condition through these um, moving, undulating forms that are there. So I think these are the things. Also, in terms of your question, David, I it's not my specialty, but I think these are the things that make that space the have the potential for different kinds of biodiversity at that little mini scale. Uh, so there's another question or two other questions. Uh, one is uh, uh, coming in by Lili, Lili Lichka, our next uh, moderation uh, uh, um, um, of the, yeah, the high-tech campus. Uh, she's going to moderate um, next Monday. So Lili, you might come in, in the, on the platform. Raphael will uh, bring you in. And then we got another one by Evelina Langer. Hello. Okay. Hello, Lily. Hello, Lily. Nice Hi, to see you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank Did you very much. Nice to see you at this lovely project. I really enjoyed listening to you and seeing the, the pictures. I was wondering. Um, how much difference there was between the program of the museum and the program of for a public park and what your choice in all in that was uh, i didn't quite get it. it it is a public park isn't it but it is also the garden of the museum and is there any was there an a development of a program by yourself or your team or was there something they wanted you to show and and have in the park um it it's interesting, there was no vision for the park during the competition. There literally was the request for a pond for two bird cages, which I designed and are built. And I didn't show any pictures today because they're not relevant and they came out very well. And then after following all the recommendations of the expert for these, they're not bird cages for birds to be in a cage, they're for the birds to get well, birds that are wounded to get well and then to be set free. So we had an expert and we followed this, you know, for years discussions and, and then when they were finished, some, another expert came and said, they're not good at all. They're not right. You can't use them. <laughs> no, we don't know what will happen to them. Those were literally the only two conditions in the brief. And the third about the field we came up with together. I proposed that and we said, yeah, I would like to have that field to show kids what it means to have a, you know, 
talking to me. So that was all there was. And I think I developed it, I, I did it from in my pri office prior to Studio Volcan. We built it with Studio Volcan, but uh, Studio Volcan is the fusion of myself and my ex-partner. And um, I just very intuitively moved forward and said, what literally, what would it take for people to be moved by, the, by a sense of nature or history of nature, or to keep discovering new things that they could explore, learn, um, find humorous, uh, all those kinds of things. So that actually all came from, from me. Um, but it yeah, thank just one you. just one last point, just to round that up. And then, in terms of the public park, for example, I did a lot of design for benches, or you know, what would be it. It's not really a public park; it's accessible to the public, but the people all come because they like it there. But the idea was these concrete stones, for example, are can be used as seating elements. So it's a, a kind of a sub, subtle integration of all things that weren't related to the atmosphere of the content. Um, don't show up like and there, there's benches on the outside, which are still part of the parcel and the edges, but so it was an attempt to make it usable by many people, but and the, the handicap path, etc, without making it look like a normal park with all the normal functions. Thank you. Um, Sorry, did you want to add I just wanted to round up your point, but do you want to add anything or ask anything. No, I was just wondering. Uh, to which degree it was a public park as a just normal public park. And I, I get a better impression now after your explanations. Thank you. But another question is, is what about the edge towards the, towards the motorway? How did you cope with that? I first um, said you have to put in a, a sound barrier wall. We'll put in a, you know, a sound barrier wall and hide it in a hedge because it's so loud on that road that no one will be able to immerse themselves in anything, let alone talk to school classrooms with that noise. And in the, of course, the, what usually happens, all the, um, what do we call it? Saving money, um, whatever. Uh, that flew out, we, we didn't, couldn't keep it. And so really it's literally a hedge, a high hedge. And then there's um, steck palm, uh, like different kinds of evergreen plants and so on. And it just is what it is. And it's part of the contradictions of this site which is a principle that I work with also in the airport park. And to say, look, this is what it is. You're getting lost in these dinosaur thighs and bones and eyeballs and stuff like this. And at the same time, there's trucks running by and um, things like that. So. Yeah, thank you. But it supports the intention of, uh, you know, of this juxtaposition of nature and, and not nature. So perhaps it's a, it helps. <laughs> exactly, my conclusion. Yeah, it's really loud out there. On, on the other hand, it's so uh, pittoresque or, or bucolico on one, on one hand, and on the other hand, it's really like this. Uh, a lot of traffic going underneath, and uh, everyone who is passing this tunnel next time uh, uh, will know what he, what he or she is missing uh, going through instead of uh, having a look up there. Um, there are two similar questions. One is by Evelina Langer and the other one is by, by Daniela Dice. Um, it's uh, maybe, maybe uh, we, we ask Evelina coming in first. Yeah, hello. hello. Um, can you hear me? Where are you from? Um, I'm from Austria Flaberg <laughs> um, and I'm currently a student or kind of finish my master's studies okay. uh, studies. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your very nice presentation um, and the insight into this uh, pretty project you have done. Yeah, the question is actually concerning the, um, the fauna of the park and um, if there's some sort of monitoring happening at, at this park indicating which may, how many species are uh, habit inhabiting this area. I don't know if you can answer that, but it would be kind of interesting to know. Yeah, no, thank you. No, it would be really interesting to know. Um, and also to get back to the, uh, David's question about that, it would be, I would even like to follow up and know what people are doing. 
if I had to guess, it, it's really a very tiny park and it's really surrounded by sports fields, private gardens, um, a church, uh, this very heavy traffic street, um, a road. It is fragmented. That's the nature of Swiss landscape is very fragmented. So it is a fragment. And I'd be amazed if it really draws anything bigger than a, a rat. To sit. Um, but it would be a very interesting question to ask. And of course, Tony with his milkweed is attempting to draw more than he could. Um, I don't know the behavior of bees very well. I don't know to what degree they will um, find this field, you know, be able to take from this field. It does very opulent blossoming at the moment. But as I mentioned, that soil below the 20 centimeters we were allowed to even use is filled with the seeds of, of the former plants. So we don't really know in that challenge or fight. I mean, actually, I wish we had more time to, I would love to hear you or David's prognosis about that. But in this typical fight of nature of what species win out um, in the end, it, it's hard to, I, I'm not certainly not a specialist in that, but I'm, I would be afraid to say that there's gonna to be too much happening there. But I could be surprised or we could be surprised because with this whole rewilding and we don't know there's a lot of foxes in the city now. And I don't know what the park can accomplish for which fauna species. I would love to though. I really would love to know. I mean to work with work continue working and learn that as well. Okay. Um Daniela Dietje from the uh, Lake Constant. Uh, Constance Foundation got a question. It's quite similar, but she's maybe, Daniela, would you like to come in or shall I? I try to now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Daniela. Um, uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, mention that um, Evelina already uh, wrote this, this question. But the second part I, I like to ask is if is there any uh, something like an evaluation, um, if the visitors of this museum are um, aware of this special design, um, maybe something like um, how much time do they use in this park or um, yeah, something like that. Is there some evaluation or some, some don't know, do we get feedback from the visitors? Um, as far as I've been able to tell, I mean, I do pass by a couple of times a year. I talk to the museum, I, I look, and I talk to the people when they're there because I like to hear what they say. And I'm not aware that the museum's doing that. It, it really is more of a garden. I like it is a we call it a park. It is a park. It was always called a park, but if we're really honest, it's um, a fairly small space. So you can see the people very well, uh, and it's. As far as I've been able to tell, it's really, really appreciated. I mean, when I'm the people, like everyone from scientists to classrooms to neighborhoods and dog walkers and picnickers, and um, it, it has, so it has, and this is something that I put my focus on. I, I hope that you don't go away thinking, gosh, you didn't tell us very much about the biodiversity and how it's going to develop. But I do put my focus very, very strongly on the socio -psycho psychology of the space. And I think the park invites many people to spread out, to sit, to move, to discover, to get lost. The kids jump from store. I mean, I didn't show the pictures tonight because uh, the time wasn't enough, but the kids use the, the, the smaller pavers, which jump, which, um, no, I was kind of reminded me to. So they, they stick out out of the ground and they use them to jump back and forth. So it becomes an inherent playground. Um, People are sitting on these edges. It, it's very, very lovely to see how the people use the space, especially I think a lot about kids and a lot about pedagogic when I work. And I really tried to make it a place where kids would be reading these words and discovering the bones and um, getting all excited and asking questions. And I think it's at, at that level, I think it su succeeds in fulfilling its purpose. Um, yeah, uh, the lady at the cashier of the museum told me that uh, a lot of the staff of the company on the other side of the road are coming in for lunchtime. And uh, she as well, the whole, the whole staff, uh, they're using it in, 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 uh, as well during their pauses they got. And uh, um, it's, it's like that, you don't have to pay to enter that garden. You can come from three sides, and uh, so you just can walk through and, and uh, 
have a rest there. It's really open. I bought a ticket, but uh, I just could have gone the other way around. <laughs> but I was interested in the museum as well, uh, which was uh, uh, done by, by um, what's the name? Armon Semadeni. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Zürich Meyer Hook, uh, architect from Zürich. It was a cooperation. So how was that? Uh, if uh, because one of our proposals for action in our in our discussion paper to biodiversity premises is uh, the um, converting the hierarchy uh, that landscape architecture and the the, um, the design of the environment and the, the open space should be impl um, in uh, implicated right from the beginning and uh, even that the water should be the, the, the point of departure for every project and uh, in that case I think uh, the, the design came later as it told because uh, during the, the competition uh, it wasn't there, no? No, it was. In fact, that was really the amazing thing. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate. I did the competition with these architects. Um, and certain elements were placed already at that time, the bird cages and the pond and the, the very few things they had. And um, the space where they could put the building was already fixed for all different reasons. So the park was there, but in the end there was no brief and also no gegen Uber. I mean, it wasn't that there was someone in the city who under, was interested in landscape and discussed with us. It was just an architect who did the pro project light to and made sure the project ran well. And that was a little bit sad because there wasn't any way to have a discussion about what open space should do. So I took all the knowledge I have and tried to make it do as much as possible. But in fact, at least it was in, it was in fact in the brief and that's already really good news. And they didn't expect, I don't think there was anyone out there thinking what this space could become. So in fact, they were all quite surprised when it started to become very dense and very rich. So it's really beyond imagination when you see the this cow made of first uh, what came out of it and uh, we have to converge. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, it's already uh, 6.15 and we have to close down the of official part. There is uh, the possibility for people who want to exchange uh, thoughts or uh, maybe have have had a look up at the at the list of the um, the, the people listening, uh, the participants. Uh, so thank you very much, Robin, for this uh, really um, amazing project uh, sharing with us. And I think it, uh, it gives uh, uh, really a big picture of what can be if uh, well-designed and well-concepted uh, uh, wilderness uh, could look like and um, it's not a contradiction on the contrary it's it's really something which can go hand in hand and um, I, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, taking part on this uh, talk on this first talk and uh, invite everyone to the next uh, events uh, Monday Monday